Hi everyone, and thank you for joining me for another of Ian's interviews. Today we're speaking to Mike Clark, the Chief Zen Architect at AMD. Mike has been involved in Zen from the start, and he's actually dates back 28 years of work at AMD, straight out of university. Now that's the first question I'm going to ask him. What exactly has he been doing all this time? So I must apologize, my video kind of really didn't work during this interview, but Mike's did. Mike's worked fine, and so what you'll mostly be seeing is his face, not mine. But that's kind of what you're here for anyway, right? So, Mr. Mike Clark, Zen extraordinaire, chief CPU architect. Um, thank you for coming on to, to talk to me. Uh, what I really wanted to get to sort of as a first question of this interview is you are an enigma. And I say this in the very nicest possible terms, because whenever I interview somebody, we do you know, a little bit of background research into what they've done, where they've cropped up, what companies they've been. Uh, it's, it looks like you've been at AMD since you left university in 1993. <laughs> so we're getting on for almost 30 years. And then trying to document your work history at AMD, you've kind of cropped up publicly as uh, you know, Zen chief architect. Um, but can you sort of give us an overview of the projects you've worked on at AMD since you started and, you know, on the way up to Zen? Yeah, so I was, uh, I started right out of school out of the University of Illinois on the K5. Our first, you know, grounds up x86. So that was awesome. I, you know, I, I had several offers, but I chose that because it was the only one that they actually let me, you know, own a block with the TLB. <laughs> And back then, it's crazy. <laughs> Not only did you, you know, you owned the RTL, you owned the verification of your own block. We learned that's a really bad idea. <laughs> and you owned uh, the physical design as well. You had a, a physical designer you worked with that you ran the synthesis tool yourself. So you took your block like, like soup to nuts. And so that's what I kind of cut my teeth on, you know, learning the disciplines. And then... You know, we, I was on the TLB, which, you know, nobody knew how a TLB, an x86 TLB worked, you know, since we were just second sourcing Intel design. So I had to go out and explore and figure out, you know, reverse engineer how, you know, the x86 TLB worked. It was, it was a ton of fun. You know, I learned a lot. Um, but from there, uh, you know, we ended up, uh, you know, buying next gen, getting K6, had to integrate it in. I helped integrate it in. Then we did K7. Um, I was like the lead microcode guy on K7. Um, and that was just, I call that the dream team. I mean, I learned those, each block lead on, on K7 was just awesome. And I learned so much from those guys and learned how to, that's where I really learned how to, you know, build a great, uh, micro architecture from there. Uh, I, I did the Greyhound core. I was the lead architect there, which was a derivative off of K8. Um, and then, I, you know, we were doing the whole bulldozer thing. Uh, I, I worked on that. I was a lead architect on the steamroller version. And then, you know, uh, came, but worked on all of them in different roles. And, um, yeah, then I got, I became uh, the lead architect to Zen and, um, so that's, and, you know, have, now I'm in charge of the whole roadmap. Uh, but I still, you know, you know, here at AMD, um, you know, a lead architect, you know, goes from, you know, high level design all the way to silicon, post silicon, dealing with customers so that you really learn, you know, which, which of your decisions were good and which were bad and something. And, you feel the pain that, you know, your work is put on the software community and you learn and so you can do it better the next time. So you really are with, you know, the design for a long time and I really believe in that, that you don't, you know, you don't just work till first silicon or to, even to execution phase and move on. You have to feel the pain of everything in your design so you can be a better architect. So, so now we have, you know, um, I'm not, I run the roadmaps. So now we have lead architects, great guys who, who are now lead architects on, you know, Zen 2 and Zen 3. Um, uh, but yeah, maybe I'm, yeah. 
Got a little so, bit so, so what, maybe, but uh. <laughs> so 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 what what would you what would your official title be then? Chief roadmap of Zen. Uh, uh, yeah, leader of the core architect, leader of the, the core roadmap. I would say. So, I guess that's kind of. Cool. I don't really think about titles that much, you know. I'm just... <laughs> So, I mean, th this quarter is all about five years of Zen and Ryzen, you know, ever since those press events. And I think I met you in the sort of first microarchitecture disclosure around okay. Hot Chips, August 2016, you know. So at that time, you're talking about design of the core and what's going to happen. Realistically, when did the Zen journey start for you? Right. Uh, you know, time frame, two, three years before. And beyond that, you know, sort <laughs> of who, who are the big names? in that team that you want to, you know, mention? Well, it started in 2012 uh, for me and a, and a bunch of people. Um, you know, we realized we needed to do something different uh, from the bulldozer line. And, uh, you know, Jim came in and helped reorganize the team. And, you know, I was the lead architect. And, yeah, so it's been, it's not five years for me. It's almost 10 years <laughs> since we started in 2012. Um, yeah, I, I hate to mention people because I know I'm leaving out. There's so many people. The team is awesome. And so many people, I am so thankful um, that I, I get to even represent the work of so many awesome engineers. Uh, but yeah, Suzanne Plummer, uh, you know, was the, the lead of the team, managing the team. And, you know, it was just keeping the team together. Uh, she was just awesome. Um, you know, Mike Took, uh, uh, Tim Wilkins, just all kinds of people. Jay Fleischman, Leslie Barnes, all kinds of people that were just, you know, contributing from all parts of the company to make, uh, to make Zen a success. So, uh, and, and it's kind of funny too. Like you say, you know, you've been working out since 2012. You know, I, uh, I go back, if I go back and I still have like, you know, our HLD deck that we did, you wouldn't believe how different when you, it takes five years to get something to, you know, production, how different it looks. I mean, the bones are still there. You see it, but so many things change along the way. And that's, that's one of the keys to this business is being able to be dynamic, have things change because it's such a long time zone and still be able to deliver, you know, a, a competitive, uh, design. It's, it's pretty amazing. And I have to, I, I, once in a while, when it, when we're starting up and the team's all, you know, worried that they, you know, they're not they're feeling weird about their HLD. I'm like, here, look, this is what Zen was. Okay. Everything's not going to be perfect coming out of HLD. Stuff is going to change and it's going to get better. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's the, you know, art of this uh, job. Is it ever, realistic to be able to pivot a design based on what a competitor has just released or is it you do you still have that sort of two-year lead if you re, if you really want to respond in that way i you know it matters yeah we can you'd be surprised at how quickly we can respond it still feels like a long time but uh you know we're constantly uh you know evaluating the competition and and you know comparing themselves to, our, to us and and yeah trying to make sure uh you know we're staying on track i mean but one part of it too is we we have to set our own goals right we can't yep. wait for them and that's what, and you know we've seen historically what you know has happened in the industry and we set those aggressive goals for ourselves and uh just try to hit them independent of what the competition is doing as well. But we keep our eyes on them, of course. One of the cool stories that came out of that sort of first generation Zen Ryzen saga um, that we kind of learned of after the fact is that the CPU development funding was frozen and ring fenced away from the rest of the business when AMD was necessarily, wasn't necessarily going through the best times financially. How was that sort of a benefit or limitation manifest from your perspective you know practically emotionally is there any benefits to that yeah i mean it's it's definitely you know it takes a, a big investment um because of the long time frame right and especially when you know we kind of when you went off 
uh, the bulldozer architecture line uh, with that long lead time, it, it's it's tough for the business to, uh, you know, the market wants a product every year, you know, to keep trying to refresh, waiting for the new big thing to come. So it was definitely uh, necessary um, so that we could do what we needed to do uh, to get the job done. And, and it was a tough time. I mean, that's one of the, I think that's really uh, one of the hardest problems <laughs> we had was really holding the team together. I mean, a lot of people did leave. Uh, it was, you know, a very aggressive uh, program. And, you know, from where we were, you know, spent a lot of time, you know, both trying to convince people that we would succeed and that, you know, even with succeeding, we still knew we were going to, you know, you know, if the competition keeps going at their track, you know, they may still be ahead of us when the first one comes out. But, you know, that's what we needed to do to get a solid base under ourselves to then bring out Zen 2 and Zen 3. And really, we get ourselves on a trajectory where we could be a leader in the industry. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but I recently had the opportunity to interview Jim Keller and ask him about his time at AMD. Um, he mentions early on a sort of large 8 a.m. meeting um, in like a in like a conference hall about chip design, where there are lots of disagreements and lots of things written on a whiteboard about what could be done, couldn't be done. And there were some people saying it could be done, others they couldn't. So. One of the questions I got ahead of this interview from one of the people on, on my uh, channel was that, what was it like to be summoned to that meeting, you know, discussing those ideas, you know, at the time when Zen is still, you know, very nascent and early on? No, I, to, for me, it, it's awesome. I mean, that, uh, you know, that en engineering exchange of uh, essentially what we would call concept. We do it for every project, really, concept of what we want to do. Of course, at that time, for such a big transition, um, I would say there's probably more arguments than less. I mean, we had, you know, we had, we didn't, we hadn't done SMT. Yeah. And we hadn't done an op cache. And there were a lot of people that thought trying to do both of those in the same thing was a, going to be a disaster. There's no way we'd be, you know, and I had to convince people, Hey, you know, the bulldozer threading model, you know, we've learned a lot. There's a lot of SMT like stuff in the bulldozer line. So we've learned a lot of the ways to do SMT, even though we hadn't, you know, done it in the execution units and the data cache. Um, so it wasn't really that big a step for us, um, as it would be for someone who'd done none of it before. And, you know, the op cache, we've done a similar thing on a project that got canceled before. And really, um, we should have been doing it in Bolos or two. Um, but, you know, it was like, this is, guys, this is what, you know, we need to do to get, to hit our aggressive goal of, you know, a 40% IPC uplift. Um, and so, you know, I think from that, you know, the people who saw that it was possible, stayed on and some of those who thought it was, you know, not possible decided to go their own way. So, and, and, uh, you know, that's, that's what it, that's engineering, right? I mean, it, it, it's tough, right? I mean, we know that engineers are good at, you know, uh, you know, at smelling out bullshit, right? So you have to be very careful not to, uh, not, you can't give them impossible goals, right? Because then they'll see that it's impossible and they won't, they'll, you know, they, they, they see themselves set up to fail. But, you know, you can't have easy goals either, right? So you, you have to find that nice balance between, you know, not impossible goals, but really hard goals. And then, and tell them, you know, if we don't get there, it's still going to be all right as well. But we have to set these aggressive goals and we have to try to get to them. And if, once you get guys bought in on it, you're, you'd be amazed at, you know, how hard they will work to, to get it done. Also, in, in the interview with Jim, um, so there, there, there's this thing going around online, I'm not sure if you're aware, but people call him the father of Zen, right? And I asked him the question, are you the father of Zen? And he said, well, I'm more like one of the crazy uncles, right? So so does that mean, does that, does that mean you're the father of Zen? 
<laughs> I mean, I definitely agree with uh, with Jim that you know it, it takes a lot of people to make Zen what it is. But yeah, uh, I think I am the father of Zen. I mean, in the sense that I gave Zen its name. You know, I was there in 2012 on its first day. You know, I was I, I was with it all the time. I know everything good and bad about it, just like you do your own kids, right? You know what they're good at, you know what they're not good at. You know, uh, I've I've felt the pain of all, you know, our bad decisions, and I've seen the joy of all our good decisions. And you know, like like a child, you know, you have it, you you, you know, you have the chip. You finally have to let it out into the world, right? And you don't have control over it anymore. You had control, you. And, and other people judge it and, you know, you take it personally. I mean, you're, you're with us for so long, five years. I mean, you really get emotionally invested. And yes, <laughs> because of that, you know, other people can come and go and move on. You know, I was with Zen from the beginning <laughs> to the end. So I do, uh, consider myself the father, but there's, you know, like I said, there's, it, it took an amazing team. To make it happen, I didn't make it happen by myself. Just like raising a child doesn't happen from one person either, right? It takes a, it takes a many people. So it's funny that you mentioned the naming um, because I actually spoke to uh, the CMO uh, John Taylor on LinkedIn recently because you know that AMD is doing this uh, bunch of marketing around five years of Zen, and uh, I, I said, "Are there any stories that I should ask you about?" And and he said, "Oh, Mike has loads of stories, but ask him about the story behind." The Zen and Ryzen naming. Yeah, so the Zen naming came about from, um, you know, with the bulldozer architecture and, and I guess what I feel like I've learned over all those years building x86 cores is that, you know, you need to find the right balance in the architecture between, you know, frequency, IPC, power, area, and, you know, we weren't there with bulldozer. And so I felt... You know, for our new project needs a name that talks about what our true goal is, is to have a balanced architecture. And um, so I, I thought, you know, Zen made sense to me for what we were doing. We were trying to, uh, you know, have a nice balanced uh, architecture. And like, and, you know, I think that from the Ryzen point of view, when I think when they, when they showed it to me the first time, they were a little nervous. Um, that, you know, I might not like it, <laughs> but when I saw it, when I saw the Enzo, when I saw it was an open Enzo, you know, the, the beauty of imperfection, which we know, you know, Zen is not perfect. <laughs> it has its problems. It just like, it, it like perfectly represented what I thought of when I named it, you know, in 2012 as Zen. So it was just this perfect synergy and no one really had, talk to me about it i think they were again i, I think they were nervous but when they showed it to me it's like guys this is awesome this is exactly this is exactly what um i was thinking without even uh, telling you and when the lawyers came back and said yes we can trademark it you were like yeah <laughs> yeah that helped you too yeah <laughs> oh and one sorry and one other thing i even like about it is the you know it sounds a lot like rising Rising, rising, yep. and yeah, it just has that that secondary feel too that I thought was brilliant. That we're AMD was rising back up, um, so yeah, <laughs> it's just just a genius marketing to me. So uh, alongside that first generation Zen bringing up, we learned about Project Skybridge, the ability to put an x86 and an ARM SOC on the same, essentially in the same socket, same package. Were you involved anyway in that ARM version? I think it's called K12. And or did you know how far it went before it kind of got put in the can? I think uh, I, I thought we did. I, I mean, originally the the Zen and, and K12 were. Um, I think we call them sister projects. Yeah. You know, the, they were meant to. Uh, you know, had kind of the same goals, just a different ISA. Uh, actually, uh, hooked up. It was kind of the core proper was that way. You know, the L2, L3 hierarchy could be either one. 
And then, of course, SkyBridge, the, the data fabric could be either one. Um, and so, yeah, um, I wasn't, you know, there was a whole team doing the K-12 core. Uh, we did share a lot of things, you know, to be efficient um, and had a lot of good debates about architecture. Because really, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, although I've worked on x86, obviously, for 28 years, I mean, it's just an ISA, right? Uh, you can build, uh, you know, a low power, low design or high performance out of either of those, out of really any ISA. I mean, ISA does matter, but not, you know, it's not the main component, nor you can change the ISA if you need some special instructions to do stuff. I mean, but really the, you know, the, the microarchitecture, the design is in a lot of ways independent of the ISA. There are some interesting quirks in the different ISAs, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, you know, it's really about microarchitecture. So on that line, um, we always talk about low hanging fruit with any process design, but realistically, how shortly after the design is signed off, do you start thinking, oh, that could have been done better and we need to improve that for the next gen? It's like, uh, you know, it's even, it's a year even before the first tape out, we've realized, you know, because you realize it's, it's funny about the microarchitecture that, you know, certain decisions drive certain decisions drive certain decisions. And that's kind of the key to it. If the first decision was bad, you know, there's a lot of rework to get back down the right track. So we try to make those first decisions as best as we can. Um, but some of them, yeah, you know, uh, need to, need to be redone and it's too late. Um, and hopefully it's one of the ones further down the path. Uh, but you know, that's, that's kind of the, the reality of, uh, microarchitecture. So that is kind of as we maybe see in our strategy is we know when we do a grounds up design that there are going to be, you know, a lot of those opportunities to improve it. And so we do want, uh, in our, in our strategy is to do a derivative, derivative, but make it a big derivative, make it worth, you know, the, 12 to 18 months it's going to take to get it done. But then having done that, you know, that doing a second derivative is usually, you know, there's not, there's not much you can gain from that as in a kind of uh, a performance power view. You know, you can add more to it, but you add more power. You're kind of like, I, I like to say, bolting things more on the side. You can't really get in and redo the guts of the machine. So, you know, our strategy is to do grounds up design, do a derivative and then come back with another totally grounds up design where we, you know, we rethought everything uh, through the pipeline. And um, we may still, you know, we use things. We still have an op cache. We're not getting rid of the op cache, but we do it in a, in a much different way. The way it, in it interfaces with the instruction cache, the way it feeds into the machine changes. And we need, and we need to, um, you know, rethink that to get wider. We have to really rethink not just making the, the, you know, dispatch execute wider, but the whole machine has to understand that. So we have to basically tear up the whole thing, put it, you know, put it down on, on kind of block diagrams, clean, clean sheet of paper. And then as you go, as our guys go to code, it's like, Hey, well, this part isn't changing. I can just. I'll grab that RTL from the past, but this needs to be totally redone, right? And so we do still use parts of the old designs. If it's that part isn't really changing this time, we decided that that was good enough, you know, that worked for this design. But, uh, you know, every, you know, three years, we're pretty much, and really we have to, that's to manage the power, like I said. So now we can put these widgets in, in a whole new pipeline and really control the power of them so they don't just burn all the power equivalent to the IPC and we really go, you know, nowhere from a, in a constrained power environment. So, I mean, long-term R&D roadmaps, we usually, you know, publicly a three-year roadmap is presented. Then we know internally, you know, there's like a five and seven year timescale. AMD, you know, has grown since the first generations of Zen came out. There's arguably more money floating around. The company's doing a lot better. So has that sort of way of thinking about roadmap to change since the Zen project started? Um, no, 
Uh, not no. really. I mean, <laughs> I think we still, uh, it may surprise you, but yeah, I mean, we didn't, even back in 2012, it wasn't, um, we were thinking, you know, well beyond Zen, especially since, yeah. And, um, you know, our, your customers demand that, right? I mean, they're not going to switch over to using you if you don't have a long-term roadmap. So our customers kind of demand that um, to, to want to do business with us. And of course, for our own, um, our own teams demand that they want, our teams want to see a roadmap. Uh, there were a lot of people that even internally were worried that, you know, we weren't going to be able to sustain uh, the rate of progress. And it is, it's a very risky strategy. I mean, tearing uh, the whole core up, uh, you know, <laughs> every three years um, uh, is risky. But to me, I've, I've, I've managed to convince everyone it's what we have to do. It's what the market requires. And if we don't do it, someone else will, and we will be behind. So for the one year anniversary of Ryzen, there's an April 2018 video on YouTube um, where you mentioned that you're working on Zen 5. We're now three years later. Does that mean you're working on Zen 8? <laughs> well, I, you know, I, you've done the math pretty well. I'll just say that. <laughs> um, I, I got a little well, flack for saying that, by the way, but I mean, it's no. the reality. I, I think you guys know that's how you know, hard this business is that, and how, like I was saying earlier, how you have to be dynamic and willing to have processes that you can change as the market changes around you from what you originally set out to do. If you build what you we set out to do, you'll, you'll put out something that nobody wants. Yeah. So that's the reality of it. So one of the things we've noticed with CPU architects is so some of them have a different mindset to others and so I want to know are, are you the sort of architect that will be in the room during the first bring up of the first silicon back from the fabs and if so what's that like what's the atmosphere in the room I would love to um, a lot of times they won't even let me in there but <laughs> I definitely was I mean I more that I get in there later I mean when it first comes back you know, there, there's a lot of, of bring up activities with BIOS and firmware that really, you know, don't even involve the core. And so um, there's not a lot of need for myself or even, a, you know, a strong, the lead architect of that generation uh, in there. Uh, but very quickly as, as the team brings it, you know, gets it going and booting, um yeah um you know on the original zen one of the <laughs> one of the funny stories i have is that i was um the first a0 had um definitely had some issues and we had to run it really cold to uh right. to, to have it run and, and and we waiting for the fix the a1 to come uh or even i think it was an a0 plus to, to solve the issue so we didn't have to run for cold anyway <laughs> Uh, one of, one of the engineers, uh, I am me like, Hey, have you tried out the patch on it yet? It's like, no, I'm sitting here waiting for it to dry. We have to keep it so cold condensation builds up. So we have to stop <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and let it dry off. As soon as it dries off, I'll, I'll let you know if your patch works. So, I mean, it's, it's crazy, but yeah, I love working in lab. I'm definitely an architect who uh, likes to get his hands dirty. Um, and unfortunately, I, you know, I don't get to get them as dirty as I used to. But yeah, I, I get involved in um, usually much later when we have really hard problems. <laughs> so. so so it's 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 funny you bring up that story because I'm kind of interested in as to, OK, so you get that A0 silicon back and it doesn't work right normal temperature. So you have to put it on cold. Who thinks of that? How does one come to the idea that that's what it needs to do just to run properly? And then how do you go about finding the fix for the A0 Plus? Is that a design fix or is that a manufacturing fix? And how how do you find the difference between the two? No, in that case, you know, um, we have lots of uh, ways to, you know, test the silicon 
you know, PFP design for test to realize that just low level circuits, uh, aren't working properly. And, and we have strong circuit team does, that, you know, debug that issue, realized, you know, that it's a, it's a problem with temperature, but if it was cold, it can still, uh, you know, it can still work. And so, um, and what, what was wrong with the circuit so that now they can, uh, they can fix the circuit and, and do like a zero plus and, and get us things that can run at normal temperatures. So that's, that's again, I mean, the amount of, you know, the amount of engineers, great engineers working on any given product here at AMD is amazing. And with skills that, you know, I, I like to think of myself as well rounded, but you know, there are people that are just, Way better than me at a lot of things, obviously. So yeah, the ones that have done the ten thousand, hundred thousand hours just on the one thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Moving to some more sort of holistic, you know, sort of architecture, and maybe a little bit of future questions. Um, one of the one of the things that we've been following recently is you know modern x86 core variable length instruction set, both. Intel and AMD, the high performance cores, all the way back from Zen 1, the decode width has been, you know, four wide. And we're starting to see, you know, dual three wide designs and six wide designs relying on opcache to save power. And obviously four wide has worked really great for AMD in, you know, Zen all the way up to Zen 3. You know, from a holistic perspective, how does, say, the size of that decode engine on x86 change with fundamental IPC modeling? Because going beyond four sounds like it wastes a lot of power and there has to be sort of mitigations. Um, I mean, well, I, I, again, I think it uh, it comes back to that, the balance aspect in the sense that I think going beyond four with, you know, sort of the number of transistors and the smarts we have in our branch predictor and the ability to feed it um, through decode uh, it worked fine, but we are going to go wider. Uh, you're going to see us go wider and to be efficient, you know, we'll have the transistors around the front end of the machine to make it being wider, uh, the right architectural decision. So it's, it's really, you know, having the continuous, you know, uh, in increase in transistors that we get allowing us to beef up the whole design to continue to get uh, more and more uh, IPC out of it. How, how, how reliant are you on your competitive analysis and workload prediction teams when it comes to sort of the fundamental ground up designs? Because if, you, if you're doing that back in 2012, trying to predict 2016 <laughs> workloads, that's a bit of a leap, right? No, it is. Um, and we, we are, we have great teams there and it, in some sense, the problem you're stating is kind of independent of, of the team, right? It's, you're trying to build a processor on the software of today or the software of five years from today. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's where a lot of it comes down to, uh, you know, being, you know, experienced as an architect, you know, seeing Seeing what you're seeing in the traces, but going beyond that and realizing that kind of also, I feel the converse that like you're saying with the four wide, you know, a lot of the compilers, you know, the optimizations they would like to do don't make sense if you only have a four wide machine. But when we give them something wider, they will realize how to compile the code to make it even better. So, you know, we'll look at, okay, we only managed to get you know, 10, 15 percent IPC on these older codes that when we launch, but as the compilers develop, they'll be able to extract more and more out of our future designs based on what they get out from our current design. Uh, on the concept of cache, now AMD's vCache announcement for products coming next year is obviously quite big. I'm not going to ask you about necessarily products, but <laughs> how much cash is the right amount? Which is a stupidly open-ended question, but that's the way it's intended. <laughs> no, yeah, it, it's not, you know, it's a great question. And it's not just even about how much is 
the right amount, but at what level, what latency, what sharing. So, you know, those are all uh, trade-offs that, you know, we have to decide how to make and what that will mean uh, for software. And then work with, since we are choosing, you know, we have chosen, um, you know, our core complex to have, to have kind of, let's say, a split L3, right? Where, as opposed to one uh, gigantic L3 shared across all the threads. And of course, by when you, the more you share a giant L3 across the threads, the latency to any given thread gets longer. So you're making a trade off there of, of sharing or get, getting more capacity in, say, a lower thread count versus the latency it takes to get it. So, um, you know, we, we have balanced for, let's say, you know, trying to hit on that lower latency, still providing great capacity at the L3 level. And, you know, uh, that's the, the, the optimization point we've chosen. We continue to, you know, as we get, uh, as we go forward, you know, getting more cores, getting more cores in a sharing L3 environment, um, but still trying to manage that latency so that when there are lower thread counts in the system, you're still getting good latency out of that L3. And the L2, how much, you know, if your um, L2 is bigger, then you, you know, you can cut back some on your L3 as well. It's, it's a, it's a fascinating, you know, cash trade-off studies, um, you know, have been going on forever and they continue forever of how to balance out the, cash hierarchy uh for the core so it, it's a it's a it's a funny thing you bring up um the l2 because i'm not sure if you saw ibm's recent announcement on their z16 yep. chip where they've got very large l2s and they're using them as virtual l3s as well have you looked into that at all does that seem appetizing does that seem relevant to sort of amd's endpoint yeah, we've definitely looked into it. Um, uh, Will Walker is actually the the head of our our cash team. He's an awesome uh, architect. Um, you know, we uh, like I said, we every you know HLD <laughs> we go through these same uh, uh, questions, same designs. Look at different design points, uh, and then have to settle on one and then even like I've been saying sometimes post HLD things change and and we um, we even decide to switch to a different design point we, we can do that um, so yeah it's a it's a constant evolving um, architecture we've seen TSMC demonstrate in research that they can go stack 12 high with TSVs in a similar way to AMD's L3 cache. Um, I'm not asking whether you're going to do a 12 high stack in the future, <laughs> but I w what I would like to ask is how many layers do you think could be supported before issues like thermals in the base die become, you know, apparent? No, there's definitely, there's a lot to that, to architecting, uh, those levels beyond the base architecture, as you're saying, dealing with, uh, you know, temperature, uh, and, and there's a lot of cost to be fair. And so, um, you know, and how much, uh, we, we kind of hinted at, I didn't maybe quite answer it. You know, different workloads obviously have yeah. different sensitivity to the amount of cash. And so, uh, being flexible with it, being able to have designs both with Stacking and without stacking is critical because, uh, you know, obviously, uh, some workloads that would be way too expensive, uh, for the performance uplift it would bring. Um, so like you said, I can't really, you know, comment on how many levels of stacking, uh, we can do or we will do, but yeah, it's, it's, it's an exciting technology that is going to continue uh, to grow. So on that front, uh, pivoting to sort of EDA tools, um, the big EDA tool vendors, Cadence Synopsys, 
are currently in the midst of a big marketing drive for their machine learning accelerated tools, being able to op use um, machine learning to optimize floor plans, optimize designs. Has AMD incorporated any of that technology into its tool chain yet? <laughs> I, I don't think I'm allowed to to say that definitively, but I think you know you can probably. I think everyone is using some form of uh, you know machine learning through data to improve everything in uh, in all our business processes. So. That's a that's a that's a very careful answer. <laughs> Let me just that's leave great. it at that. Yeah. yeah, sure. With the first generation of Zen, we had that four core complex that has moved from into Zen three with an eight core complex. And if I was to mention leaks for Zen four, that also looks like an eight core complex. Um, <laughs> are, are are there limits to how big an individual complex in its current form can be, and sort of what things would have to change if it was you know arguably double the size or more. Um, I've highlighted that necessarily the ring bus is a limitation, um, but is there anything sort of beyond that? Well, I mean, I think there's, you know, we do, um, you know, we do build a very modular core cache hierarchy for, you know, all our different markets from, you know, uh, the high-end servers all the way down to, you know, the low-end uh, notebooks. And so, um, obviously, you know, those environments desire also more or less cores. Um, and, you know, meeting them, trying to meet them efficiently with, uh, you know, as few designs as possible is also another interesting, you know, architectural goal that, you know, you'd like to think you can just you know, design, just focus on one thing and, and we have a core roadmap and that's, you know, and there can be multiple of them, and, but there's not. There's, you know, we have to figure out how to leverage those designs across all those markets, um, which are, you know, some markets like high-end server are, go, are going, you know, obviously are crazy for more cores, whereas others, you know, are not uh, increasing their consumption of cores at the same rate. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we are, you know, but we do see them growing. And so uh, we are, I think you'll see like we have, we will continue to increase the number of cores uh, in our core complex that are shared under an L3. Um, and as you point out, the, I mean, then communicating through that uh, has both, you know, latency problems, coherency problems, uh, but though that's what, you know, that's what architecture is. That's what we signed up for. So that's what we live for is solving those problems. So I'll just say that, you know, the team is definitely already has, you know, looking at what it takes to grow to a complex far beyond, uh, where we are today and, and how to deliver that in the future. Do you see, any part of the Xilinx acquisition becoming part of Ryzen's future? Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, I Is can't there anything comment, in particular? Yeah. I can't really comment on anything in particular. I think if uh, you know, you know, we sell SOCs, but we obviously integrate a lot of IP into them. I mean, if you look at you know their IP and our IP, you know, you can probably see some natural. Synergy there um, that you will like to see, you, you will likely see in the future. So that's cool. probably not all I can say, but um, definitely excited so, getting those guys to getting on board and, and working with those guys going forward. They're a great team. IPC is always you know the golden goal of high performance process design. Um, and one of the advantages of the smaller nodes is just more transistors, bigger buffers, more execution units, larger caches. How do you approach how to make the core smarter than rather than just simply bigger? And what can you, can you say? What sort of key elements of modern x86 design end up being limiting factors there? So I would say, you know, um, I, I think IPC 
gets all the glory is, is maybe how I would say it. I mean, it really is, you know, I call it the wheel of performance um, because, you know, there's four main tenants, IPC, frequency, uh, area, and power. And they really are all, you know, equal in a sense. And you have to balance them all out um, to get a good design. Uh, and so if you add, you know, if you go for a really high frequency but crush IPC, you can end up with a really bad design. Yeah. Uh, and they decrease area. And vice versa, if you go really hard on IPC and that adds a lot of area and a lot of power, uh, you can be going backwards. I mean, and so that's really the critical part. Like we said, we're, we're trying to get that IPC, but we have to get it in a way that, that optimizes our, the transistor usage for both area and power and frequency so that we can you know, we want to be able to put a bunch of these cores in, and if we just add IPC and grow area, we're going, we're not making real progress, right? Um, and so, yeah, I get, uh, it, that's, you know, that's my job, that's my lead architect's job to try to find that right balance, and, and the whole team, and, you know, I think that was one of the big, that was one of the biggest things about Zen was that, you know, power had not been, I, I would say a part of our wheel of performance. Like we cared about power. We looked at power, but like everything else in the wheel, you know, all from eight, from high level design through execution to the end. I mean, you know, we get weekly feedback on how we're doing on all those things. We know what our area is. We know what our IPC is. We know what our frequency is. We did not have the tools early in the design to get let us know where we were in power and by the time we did there was very little we could do about it you know we were in that deep in execution where again those decisions were made and made and to redo that bad power decision i mean we got to redo we got to rip up the whole thing we'll never hit the schedule now if we do that and so that was for the original zen you know we had to we had to go create new tools. And it, it was really a stress point on the team because, you know, since they were new, a lot of the tools were just, and it's so early in the design, they're not perfect. They're nowhere near, and none of our performance or frequency tools are perfect, but people use them, they trust them. And we had to really convince the team that, hey, yeah, these tools aren't perfect, but, you know, the vector's right. For making decisions, they're good enough, you know, and, and we finally, you know, we managed to get the team kind of over that hurdle and uh, really using them, getting feedback like any other part of the design and really being able to drive that 40% um, that IPC uplift in, in a more efficient design. That was one of the first sticking points you said about that big mean to come. Like, how are we going to add 40% IPC? We're just going to add 40% power and go nowhere. How, how can you do that? It's like, yes, we can do it with the best. A better, more efficient design. So in, in, in a recent AMD video, Five Years of Zen, I think it was between John and Robert, it was discussed that having a more scalable core was the preferred approach compared to, say, a hybrid design. So what difficulties in building a core with that much scale, you know, from milliwatts to dozens of watts per core? You know, is, is it logic design? Is it power design? Is it manufacturing? I mean, it's all of those, right? But yeah, I mean, as an architect, it's, you know, we have, like I was saying, we have to consider really all the markets as we're, you know, just wanting to focus on, you know, I want to hit this IPC at this frequency at this power. It's, but we can't think of the core as one thing and one set of targets. It has to be many sets of targets and have planned in from the beginning you know, how it's going to scale up and down into those markets. And, and that has been, you know, another, uh, part of, uh, I would say Ryzen and Zen success is that we haven't been just trying to, you know, use technology to get, to try to fit this processor into a different hole of the market, right? We've, we've actually thought about how to do that, designed it. To be capable of doing that up front, so then it's easy for the back end teams 
to uh, change the product for those different markets and execute. And uh, finally, what what should AMD users look forward to? <laughs> Man, it's going to be great. <laughs> I wish I could tell you all what's coming. I you know, I have this uh, uh, annual annual architecture meeting where we you know go over everything that's going on and, and um, at one of them, I won't say when, you know, they, the team we went through. Zen 5, they, you know, I learned a lot. Um, cause nowadays as running the roadmap, I, I don't get as close to the design as I wish I could. And, you know, my coming out of there, I was like, I just want to close my eyes, go to sleep and then wake up and buy this thing. I want to be in the future. This thing is awesome. It's going to be so great. I can't wait for it. It's just that it's the hard part of this business is knowing is how it takes so long to get. <laughs> what you have conceived and you know you can build to, to production. So it's going to be great. That's awesome. Yeah, I can't wait, and I'm pretty sure everybody else watching can't wait. Um, thank you, Mike, for your time, and uh, good luck with your with your Zen 8 and Zen 9 designs that I'm sure <laughs> you're working on. Well, thanks, Ian. I can't wait to, again until uh, you know, we get to meet in person again. I remember meeting you for the first time at hot chips and then again at the original Ryzen launch in 2017 and you guys oh, I, I think i had you by the collar and i was shaking <laughs> yeah. you saying tell me tell me i think you told me <laughs> tell me if you're wrong that you you know we had just they give you systems right and you ran up to your room to run benchmarks on it. i love that <laughs> <That's so Yeah>. <laughs> awesome again again thanks for your time and uh good luck thank you Ian.